The Big Story. You think, you think because I'm an old man I can't hold my own? Well, I'll, I'll show you. Don't, don't hit me there again. I, no, no, don't. Detroit, Michigan. From the pages of the free press, the story of a sneaking suspicion that became a dead certainty. Detroit, Michigan. The story as it actually happened, Kenneth McCormick's story, as he lived it. You've seen it before, Ken McCormick, of the Detroit Free Press. In 20 years of reporting, you've seen it lots of times. But somehow, you've never gotten used to the look of murder, especially violent murder. The shattered glass, the shambles of tables and chairs, the twisted body, always the same. And now, on this Sunday morning in the suburb of Highland Park, as you stand in the living room of a shabby bungalow, now you're seeing it all over again. What a mess. Mind showing me your press card? Oh, here you are. Detroit Free Press. Name is Ken McCormick. I'm Captain Walsh, Highland Park Detective Bureau. How do you do? McCormick, huh? You the guy that got the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago? Oh, you have a good memory, Captain. What's the dead man's name? Radway, George F. Radway, age 69, worked in a candy factory. Looks like he took quite a beating. What did he die of? Broken ribs. Probably punctured his lungs. Death occurred around midnight last night, reported early this morning. Anything else you want to know? Well, I'd like to get an interview with his family. Well, you can't. He hasn't got any. One of the neighbors found his body. I see. What do you think the motive was? Robbery. What else? Look at the joint. Someone sure took it apart, but uh, this bungalow, Captain, the furnishings, the way it's kept, what I, what I mean, it, it doesn't look like the old guy had much to be robbed of. Well, somebody must have thought he had. What about all these muddy tracks on the floor? Who knows? Anyone could have made them. Even Radway himself. Ah, I hate this kind of case. You know why? Why? Because the motive's too broad, too impersonal. Robbery. Any one of 5,000 bums or hoodlums could have bust in, beaten up the occupant, ransacked the joint, and cleared out. I hate this kind of a case. Who was the neighbor, Captain? You know, the one who found the body? Oh, Mrs. Florence Kemper. She and her husband were good friends of Radway. The house is on the next street, back to back with this one. You can see a corner of it through the trees. Well, I think I'll go over and talk to her. Well, you're wasting your time. We already got her stuff. Well, at least I can get her picture. Yeah. You know, that's what I envy about you newspaper guys. You take a picture, you write a little copy, and as far as you're concerned, that's the end of it. I don't know, Captain. Sometimes it's just the beginning. You wait for Frank Harmon, your photographer, to take his shots of the murder scene. And then the two of you start out for Mrs. Kemper's. You take a shortcut that leads through the back lots from Radway's bungalow, and you've only gone about 50 yards when you see it. Frank, look over here alongside the path. Now, you see that? Yeah, I see it. So what? Now, look at the color. Grayish, tan. What do you expect from a patch of mud? Magenta? Well, don't you remember those tracks in the bungalow? Unless I'm colorblind, this stuff matches perfectly. Say... Hey, you're right. And look there, right in the middle of it. Yeah. Looks like maybe part of a footprint. You go on to the neighbor's house. And a few minutes later, you and Frank Harmon are sitting in the neat little kitchen, talking with Mrs. Kemper as she peels potatoes for Sunday dinner. You try not to notice the little tremble in her hands. You see, my... My husband and I knew the Radways for years. Ever since his wife died, George, that's Mr. Radway, took most of his meals with us. Just like one of the family. That's why it was such a shock when... Do we understand, Mrs. Kemper? That's how I came to go over there this morning. Went to call him to breakfast. Didn't he used to come over of his own accord? Mostly, yes, Mr. Harmon, but this morning we were up earlier than usual. Mr. Kemper couldn't sleep. Is your husband around now? Maybe we could talk to him. No. No, Harold's at the 11 o'clock church service. Besides, he... He wasn't there with me at the bungalow when I... Oh, you were alone then? Yes. Knocked on the back door. Wasn't any answer. 
Then I looked through the window, and right away I knew something terrible had happened. I could see the place all topsy-turvy, and, and Mr. Radway lying there, all twisted up. And then you came back here and you phoned the police? Yes. Mrs. Kemper, would you mind if I took a few pictures of you, you know, just sitting here in your kitchen, sort of? Why, I guess I wouldn't mind if you need them. Fine, just hold it like that, peeling the potatoes. Lawrence, have you got... Who are these men? What are they doing here? It's all right, Harold. Uh, we're from the Detroit Free Press, Mr. Kemper. We just want I to... I uh... know what you want. Who asked you in here, anyway? You got no regard for people's feelings? Taking pictures, asking questions. It's all right, Harold. They don't mean any harm. It's all your fault to begin with. I told you, Florence. I told you we shouldn't have reported it. But we had to. I found the body. Someone else would have found him. Someone else could have made the report. But no, you wouldn't listen. And now it's just like I said. Police and reporters swarming all over. I don't mind so much, Harold. Kind of, kind of relieves me to talk to him. Maybe you'd feel better, too. If I you... don't want to talk to nobody. My best friend just died. I got some feelings. Even if you went. I only thought... I, uh... I'm sorry, Mrs. Kemper. Yeah, we didn't intend Please to... Please excuse him. He... He didn't mean it. He, he doesn't know what he's saying. Too broken up. Yeah, sure, we... We understand. The two of you leave. Frank goes back to the office with his pictures. And as Captain Walt said, that's the end of it. But somehow, Kenneth McCormick, you don't want to drop this story. Not yet. So just for the record, you decide to check with the rest of Radway's neighbors. Come to think of it, there was someone looked mighty suspicious, a stranger, hung around the neighborhood all Saturday afternoon. I should hope to say I did see him. Why, he even came here. Pretended he was a window washer. But I knew it was funny. He was wearing a good brown suit. That's right, a brown suit. Dark hair, medium height, and a pretty heavy build. Was trying to get in that bungalow in the worst way. Come back three or four times before it was dark. Thanks, McCormick, but we already know about this window washer. The dragnet's been out for two hours You now. really think he did it, Captain? I'll bet on it. He's our man all right if we can find him. With my luck, that's a question. <laughs> suspect's description is fairly complete. But you wonder if perhaps Mrs. Kemper saw him too and could supply a few more details. So once again, you visit the little frame house. This time, Harold Kemper stays in the room. He doesn't say much until his wife starts to answer your question about the stranger. I know, Mr. McCormick. I don't remember. Yes. Yes, there was someone... I saw him. You did, Mr. Kemper? Yes. It was late Saturday night. I I was standing near the back window here, and I happened to look over to George's place. He, uh, he had the kitchen light on, and I could see this guy on the back porch. Why, Harold, you never mentioned that to me. Well, I, I was too upset, that's all. I didn't think of it. What did this man look like, Mr. Kemper? Could you see? Well, he was, uh, he was kind of tall and thin, wearing a lumber jacket. But the window washer wore a brown suit. He wasn't tall and he wasn't thin. Why, Harold, that's important. How could you forget a thing like that? You should have told the police first off. They didn't ask me. Besides, like I said, it slipped my mind. While the Kempers are talking, you move casually to the back window and look out. And it's just as you thought. Harold Kemper couldn't possibly have seen anyone on Radway's porch because from this window, the bungalow was completely obscured by trees. Then one of those little fateful accidents happens. The pencil you've been holding in your hand drops and rolls under the Davenport. You kneel to retrieve it, and there before your eyes 
is something which, in the breath of an instant, contracts your vague conjectures to a steel-hard core of suspicion. This is Cy Harris returning you to your narrator and the big story of Kenneth McCormick as he lived it and wrote it. You, Kenneth McCormick, of the Detroit Free Press, are kneeling by the Davenport in the Kemper's living room, and a wild surmise is beating inside you. For under that Davenport, obviously kicked there in an attempt to conceal them, are several broken clouds of grayish tan clay. You straighten up with the realization that somehow you've got to get a sample of that clay, a sample you can match with the tracks in the dead man's bungalow. But with the campers here in this room, it's out of the question. You'll have to get rid of them, if only for a moment. So you take a long chance. You turn to Harold Kemper, and you begin asking questions about Radway, about the man in the lumber jacket. Question after question, until finally... Listen, mister, I, I've told you all I know. Are you sure, Mr. Kemper? You forgot about the man on the porch until tonight. Now, maybe there's something else He's that you... He's right, uh... Harold. Perhaps... No. You... No, there's nothing else. Besides, I, I can't stand here talking all night. I got work to do. I got to fix the car. The car? But there's nothing... It's lo... the gas line. What do you know about them things? I'm so worried about my husband, Mr. McCormick. He's taken this thing awful bad. Now we have to go to the morgue tomorrow night at 9 o'clock and identify George's body. Harold hasn't seen him dead yet. I don't know what he'll do. It'll be kind of tough for him, I guess. Uh, Mrs. Kemper, could I, uh, could I trouble you for a glass of water? Why, certainly. That's no trouble. Just sit right there and I'll get it from the kitchen. You cross quickly to the Davenport, reach under, grab some of the clay, drop it in your pocket, and are just getting up when... Drop your pencil again, mister? Uh, yes, uh, fix your car already? I came back for a wrench. Oh. Well, uh, I'll be leaving now, Mr. Kemper. Uh, tell your wife to never mind about that drink of water. I, I don't feel thirsty anymore. Your way out in left field, McCormick. This Kemper was Radway's best friend. I know that, All Captain, right, but... so you found some clay in his house last night. What does that prove? Look at the samples. Now, here's some from Kemper's. Some from the murder scene and some from the mud patch along the path, and they're all identical. That grayish you tan color is... You can't prove things that way, McCormick. Oh. You need a thorough, detailed lab analysis. I'll send the stuff in, but it doesn't make any difference anyway, because even if it is the same... Kemper could have made those tracks at some other time. Then why did he kick the pieces under his sofa? Why did he try to hide them? Well, maybe he didn't. Maybe his wife just brushed them out of the way. Oh, nuts. His wife is as neat as a pin. She'd clean the dirt up. She wouldn't push it under the furniture. And another thing, if Kemper was such a good friend, why wouldn't he have gone to the bungalow and tried to help Radway after his wife came back and told what she'd seen? Unless he already knew the old man was dead. You can't tell about things like that. Maybe the guy gets sick at the sight of blood. A lot of people do. Yeah, sure. Kemper's a respectable citizen. I'm not going to pull him in on your hunch and leave myself open to a charge of false arrest. No, sir. Oh, well, I just thought you could... We got to lead now. We know the motive was robbery, and we know why. There was a rumor all over the neighborhood that Radway kept money in his house. You can bet that window washer heard it, too. As soon as we roust him, the case will be in the bag. <laughs> Even to yourself, you have to admit that Kemper would probably not have killed his friend just to rob him. Then your theory gets another body blow. In Radway's house, under an ironing board cover, Walsh's men find $400. That seems to clinch the robbery motive. And then comes the rabbit punch. The same day, Monday, in the late afternoon, the window washer is found. You're there in Walsh's office when they bring him in. His name is John Bruno, and his story is pitifully weak. You admit you were in the neighborhood. You admit that. I know, Captain. That's right. I was, but... And you admit going to Radway's house. Hey, 
I went to all the houses. But you went back to that house three times. I don't know. I, I, I don't remember. Oh, don't lie. The neighbors saw you. Now, why'd you go back there for, Bruno? Why? I don't know. I, I, I guess because nobody was home the first time. So I don't know. Well, where'd you go after it got dark? Where were you that night? That night? Well, I uh, went back to my room. That's all. Back to the rooming house. Can you prove it? Can you prove you stayed there all night? I don't know. I didn't see no one. I live alone. You... You gotta take my word, mister. Honest, I, I didn't go back to the bungalow. I didn't kill no one. Honest, you gotta take my word. You look at that bewildered, frightened man in the brown suit, and you know one thing. John Bruno is innocent. His story is weak. He has no alibi, no witnesses. But how many innocent people do? Then it strikes you there's one angle you haven't yet tried. Kemper's movements on the night of a crime. Well, every Saturday, a lot of the men in the neighborhood sneak off to some tavern or other. It's terrible. I wouldn't let my husband do it. Yeah, yeah, it's a beer garden on Six Mile Road. Uh, Kemper and Radway usually went out there together. Oh, I ain't seen them there last Saturday, all right. Both of them pretty drunk, so I give them a wide berth. Is that it? Is that the answer? You wish you could be sure. Then you remember something. At 9 o'clock tonight, the Kempers will be at the morgue to identify the body. You check your watch. You can make it. Maybe, maybe if you're there when Harold Kemper has to look at his dead friend, maybe you'll see something. You grab a cab, and at one minute of 9, you walk into the medical examiner's office at the city morgue. Mrs. Kemper is there, but she's alone. Where's your husband? Where is he, Mrs. Kemper? He decided not to come in. The last minute he thought it'd be too much for him. He's waiting for me out on the street corner. Just as well, I guess. All right, if it's cat and mouse, I can play that game, too. Enjoying the view, Mr. Kemper? Huh? Oh. Better than the one inside, isn't it? What do you want, mister? Well, I just thought I'd tell you how the case is coming. You were his best friend. I figured you'd like to know. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Well, have they, uh, they found anything yet? Oh, they know who the murderer is. They do? Yeah, they're just making sure of their evidence. They found a patch of mud in the back lot, you know, with a footprint in it. And now they're checking with the tracks in the bungalow. As soon as the lab tests come through, they'll probably make the arrest. Well, that, uh... That don't seem like much to go on. Oh, they have other evidence, too. Plenty of it. Well, Mr. McCormick, I see you found my husband, after all. Yes, we've been having a little talk. Uh, how about you, Mrs. Kemper? All finished inside? Yes. Yes, I made the identification all right. And Harold, you know, I'm sure it won't be long before they catch the man who did it. Oh, how could you know? Because I saw something. And I'm sure the police saw it, too. What do you mean? Well... On George's throat, there were three or four fingerprints, just as plain as could be. And the joke of it, the grim, grim joke of it, is that Mrs. Kemper has made a mistake. What she saw were not fingerprints which can be traced, but finger marks which cannot. Only Harold Kemper, in the white heat of his fear, is far beyond figuring that out. His face gives you the answer. Now you know. This man is a murderer. More than that, he's a murderer chased by the phantom of his own fear. He's ripe for the plucking. If you can just get Captain Walsh to stretch out a hand. But I told you my story, Captain. I told you a million times. Never mind, Bruno. Tell me again. What's the use? I'm only going to say the same thing. I didn't do it, so what's the use? Sergeant, take him out. Yes, sir. What's the matter, Captain? You can't crack him? No, he'll crack. When? Six months from now, out of sheer exhaustion? Look, Bruno was innocent, you know that, and Kemper is guilty. You, you just won't admit it. I've got enough complications with that. I told around. you what I found out about Kemper. I showed you the motive. Captain, the lab report is here in those three samples of clay. Well, what's the gist of it, Sergeant? They're all identical, sir. Hmm. Captain, how much proof do you want? I don't know. 
If you don't want to pull him in, at least go out to his house now and question him. The guy will break. I know he will. He's on the thin edge of nothing. But it's late. It's after midnight. What is it you really don't like, Captain? The lateness of the hour or junking your pet theory? Ah, Come on, let's go. Don't pull in the driveway, Sergeant. Just park out front. Mm, Yes, sir. All right, Sergeant. You wait here. Come on, McCormick. Oh, evening, Mrs. Kepper. Hello, Captain. I wonder if I could see your husband for a minute. I'm sorry. He isn't here. He's gone out. Do you know when he'll be back? No, I don't. Could we come in for a minute? Yes, of course, Mr. McCormick. Come in. It's kind of late to go out, isn't it? Do you know where your husband's gone? He, He didn't tell me. Is there any message you want to leave? Mrs. Kemper, you've been crying, haven't you? Is it anything to do with... No. uh... No, it's just... No, I... You'd better tell us everything, Mrs. Kemper. We'll find out anyway. You see, we... We know what your husband's done. Yes. Yes. He did it. He killed George. How long have you known this? He... He just told me about an hour ago. And we... When we came back from the morgue, he was all sick like. That finally told me that he and George got into a fight that night over over who was to buy more beer. Harold gets into terrible rages and he beat the old man up. Then when he saw he was dead, he upset everything to make it look like a robbery. Well, where is he now? I don't know. He was terribly afraid. He knew you'd be coming after him. Go on, Mrs. Kemper. He said... He said they're not going to put me in no prison. Then he rushed out to the garage to get the car. Well, he won't get far. Where's your phone? Wait a minute, Captain. The car is here. What? I saw it in the garage as we came up the walk. Hmm. Sergeant Jansky. Yes, sir? Turn your spotlight on that garage. Then come with me. We're going in after Kemper. Wait up, Captain. I want to be on this. You better stand clear. Come out of that garage, Kemper. You don't stand a chance. All right, we're coming in. Jansky, you go in on the other side of the car. I'll take this side. Yes, sir. Kemper? He's not on this side, Captain. He's not here either. Wait a minute. Huh? Look over there, sir. In that corner, just off the floor. Harold! Are you there, Harold? Oh, don't let her in here. Mrs. Camper, don't. Don't go in there. You'll only... Don't let me alone. Let me alone. Harold, where are you? Harold, are you... we read you that telegram from Kenneth McCormick of the Detroit Free Press. Not out of remorse, but out of pure fear, the killer in tonight's big story hanged himself with a piece of clothesline. His wife's story brought the instant release of the window washer and closed the case. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.